Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this Family Caregiver Webinar Series on coping with dementia care during the coronavirus. We're going to focus on caregiver well-being today. I'm really pleased to have Dr. Julio Rojas and Jennifer Merrilies to talk to us about this topic today and want to make sure that you know how to participate. So if you hover at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A tab. And if you click on that, you can type in your questions. So we invite you to type in your questions and Dr. Rojas and Jennifer will um, answer your questions at the end of the presentation. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let Jennifer and Julio take over. Great. Thank you, Sarah, and welcome today. Um, we're, first, let's introduce ourselves. I'm Jennifer Merrilies. I'm a clinical nurse specialist. I'm at UC San Francisco at the Memory Aging Center, and a lot of my work focuses on family caregivers um, and, uh, and the patients that they take care of. And I'm Dr. Julio Rojas. I'm a behavioral neurologist. Uh, I'm also at the University of California, San Francisco, the Memory and Aging Center. I co-chair with Jennifer the behavioral uh, management task force in, in, our, in our division. And uh, my, care, my work focuses on uh, care for patients with, with dementia. Great, and so um, what we, how we thought we'd organize our talk today and what we're gonna to address today is, um, first of all, why are we concerned um, with our family caregivers' health and well-being? And what are ways that family caregivers can think about and assess their own well-being and, and sort of get a yardstick for how they're doing? And then what are strategies for promoting um, physical health and emotional well-being during this um, very different time during this pandemic? And we want to say that um, we recognize that the work you do as the family caregiver is incredibly difficult and it's also incredibly valuable. Um, and that we know from our work with caregivers that you're working very hard to ensure a very high quality of life for your loved one. And um, so we don't want to come across as having like a Pollyanna attitude. We don't want to pretend that um, it's, it's easy to make changes um, in your day-to-day -day life to help promote your own physical health and well-being. But we also hope that if you see room for improving um, the way you promote or the way you manage your own health and well-being, that um, you might find some inspiration in some of the topics that we're going to cover today. And as Sarah mentioned, we'd love to get your, your questions. Um, you can type them in at any time during this, and we'll address them at the end of our, of our slide presentation. Um, but also welcome you that if, if there have been some strategies or some tips that you've, um, you've discovered or uncovered um, that um, have helped with your own health and well-being, you go ahead and type those in too because I think this is an opportunity for us all to share with one another. And we're learning new things every day um, with how people are coping with this. So um, let's first talk about why we're concerned with family caregivers health and well-being and, and just to sort of briefly um, uh, what research has shown us um, that some of the stresses about being a caregiver, um, and again, the dementia family caregivers have been a source of a lot of research um, compared to other type of caregivers and sort of compared to non-caregivers. Um, so we, we do know a lot. Um, and each caregiver has a very unique and individual response to being a caregiver. But we do know some things about caregivers as a group, um, and as a group, caregivers can experience negative effects from caregiving. Um, there's a lot of stresses um, and dementia family caregivers have higher rates of being depressed, um, higher rates of feeling burdened and stressed about their caregiving um, responsibilities. And, and then some that we thought were sort of more pertinent to today's talk is that a majority of caregivers were never asked about their willingness or their ability to assume caregiving. It's, it, it ends up being kind of an expectation um, um, and an obligation for many caregivers and, and one that many are willing to assume. But I think it's just important to sort of make that point that for many caregivers, um, they don't receive sort of a question about or their ability to assume this sort of these responsibilities. We've also found through working with caregivers and through thinking about research that many caregivers um, spend a lot of time worrying that they're not doing enough for their loved one, worried that they could be doing something better, that they could be doing something faster. So that tends to be a common stress. 
And what we also know is that many caregivers sacrifice their own health because of caregiving demand. So caregivers may take their loved one to their health care providers, but they don't go to their own health care providers. So they're not really seeking out or assessing um, possible risks to their own health and, and not getting uh, treatment maybe for their own health problems. This is um, the Alzheimer's Association puts out um, facts and figures every year. Um, they cut a lot of their report every year covers um, sort of the plight of family caregivers and, and sort of the, the, the purpose of this slide is to show that when we think about the physical stresses of caregiving and the emotional stresses of caregiving um, that most caregivers are experiencing um, either high or very high um, stresses emotionally and physically um, because of the caregiving tasks that they've assumed. And then this was um, taken from the Family Caregiver Alliance, which if you haven't been connected to the Family Caregiver Alliance, you, you, you probably ought to be. Um, they're a wonderful source of education and support. And sometimes some of the stresses in caregiving really involves kind of identifying some of the personal barriers or some of the sort of the attitudes or values um, and the pressures um, that each one of you may have around being a caregiver. And for a lot of um, caregivers, there's a feeling that maybe you're being selfish by putting your needs first above your loved one's needs. Um, it can be frightening to think about your own physical health or emotional health needs. And so part of um, thinking about that or feeling if you're fearful or frightened about it is sort of identifying what is that fear about. And I think the majority of caregivers um, uh, from the caregivers that I've worked with really have trouble asking for help and asking for what you need. Um, people often feel that they're inadequate by having to ask for help, that they should be able to shoulder these responsibilities on their own. Um, and it can be really difficult um, to sort of one, identify what kind of help would help you and then to actually reach out and ask someone for help. So these again are all some of the stresses that a lot of caregivers experience. And then just a few other personal barriers. Again, this is work from the Family Caregiver Alliance that um, most caregivers feel this intense responsibility for their loved one's health and well-being. Um, there's often a sense that if they're not really in charge of the caregiving and managing the patients, um, no one else will do it or other people won't be able to do it as well. Um, sometimes um, this brings up feelings of, you know, uh, love and attention and respect um, that people um, feel that they should have from being a caregiver, um, and then other sorts of um, pressures or values and attitudes that often come up, um, promises that we feel we make and the obligations, the sense of obligation that we often have um, for the people that we're taking care of. So we have, we're in the middle of this pandemic and we think about this illness, COVID-19 and how it's affecting mental health. And, um, and I think to, to think back to the slides we just went over, you know, we have a lot of research that family caregivers are vulnerable to a lot of effects of stress um, from caregiving, and, and these effects are even before we've had this pandemic. And so what were some of the effects that we're seeing as a result of COVID-19 and the pandemic is that our caregivers are feeling more so social isolation, um, really being cut off from people that they've relied on for emotional support or practical help with caregiving. Um, there's been more restrictions to personal freedom. Um, so people, day programs have closed um, and there's uh, assisted living and memory care facilities have been closed to visitors. So it's really restricted caregivers ability um, to, to go about and sort of manage caregiving issues and, and sort of pay attention to their loved ones needs. There's been a financial impact for a lot of caregivers. Um, and resource shortages, it's been harder to, um, it's become a more complicated process to, to get a bag of groceries um, and to do some shopping and to get supplies. And, and for many people who used to go into um, a brick and mortar store to buy supplies or um, ordering things online um, as a way to stay home and shelter in place. And, and so there's been longer lines and delays on getting food and resources. And then a lack of physical activity as we're all being asked to shelter in place. Um, um, for many of us here in California, um, the, the parks have closed um, and places that maybe we would normally go out and get some activity have been closed. And so we've been really restricted to being at home um, um, and, and really having a, a lack of physical activity compared to how we maybe were um, handling things before. 
So we wanted to make sure that you had an idea of ways to think about your own health and well-being. Um, so we have two uh, tools that we wanted to cover and we're going to have these tools. These are handouts and they'll be available on our website next to this webinar. Um, so you'll be able to look at these in more detail. On the left is a self-check tool, and we developed this tool in one of our Memory and Aging Center care programs, the Care Ecosystem, and again, we'll have a copy on our website with this. And we designed it thinking that it would help caregivers sort of think about how they're doing in categories such as exercise, sleep, their mood. And we think by looking at this and kind of going through it on your own, it can maybe give you kind of a ballpark idea of how you're doing. And in general, if you're falling into one of the orange or red areas, then we've got some recommendations about taking steps to improve your situation. And if you're doing well, you're in that green area, then congratulations and keep it up because it sounds like you're able to manage your life and your caregiving responsibilities in a way that um, is, is in a way that shows that you're really being able to pay, pay attention to your own health. And then on the right side is a um, very brief two-page handout from the National Institute on Aging and just in general, just tips for caregivers and how to take care of yourself and sort of gives some ideas about how to deal with some of the emotional um, feelings of frustration and guilt. And you've just got a snapshot of the handout, but again, the full handout will be on our website if you want to take a look at that. And then also I mentioned the Family Caregiver Alliance and we'll make sure we have the link for you um, uh, on our website. But they also go into um, great detail and have some really nice handouts about really specific ways that caregivers can and can uh, sort of assess how they're doing um, and see if they fall into a category where maybe they need to take some steps to to um, to improve their health and well-being. And then. In general, it's important to sort of think about the signs of stress. And I think, you know, most of us may feel any of these issues, um, any of these signs of stress at any one given time. So I think you'd want to be more concerned about sort of persistent feelings. So a persistent sort of feeling of um, being irritable and, and having, you know, a harder time controlling your mood and perhaps, you know, reacting with anger and irritability. Sleep problems, again, these can happen pretty commonly, but if it's a sustained um, problem and you're maybe losing sleep because you're anxious and worried, that might be a sign of, of needing some help and some attention to your health and well-being. Forgetfulness, problems with attention and focus. If your mood, again, is persistently low or you're having periodic thoughts of suicide or just a persistent feeling of anxiety and worry, those are all things that um, we would encourage you to reach out to your provider, reach out to someone that, that you trust um, to get some attention for. And then um, let's talk about, let's move a little bit now to strategies for promoting your health and well-being. And we thought we'd divide these up into sort of three main categories, and this is how we'll kind of address, but uh, and, and again, we're going to try to make this very specific to strategies that you can consider during this pandemic. So one is, first one is taking a break from caregiving, um, promoting your physical health, and then ways to promote your emotional well-being as well. And I think First of all, be kind to yourself. And if there's a mantra um, that you can sort of uh, keep in front of you at all times, it would be this, and that you're worthy and uh, deserving of, um, of taking care of yourself and of taking a break and doing things that um, promote your physical and health well-being. So be kind to yourself. Um, when we think about respite or taking a break, um, again, during a pandemic, can you think about, are there even small duties that could be handled in a different way that might relieve some of the stress for you? So for some caregivers, um, having grocery delivery has reduced the stress of going into the grocery store and risking exposure. So arranging to have the groceries delivered or have someone else deliver them, uh, the groceries for them. Um, also having someone else maybe pick up medications if, if again, if, it, if you're worried about the stress of an exposure, getting your dog out for a walk, um, time with your loved one with social distancing while you go for a walk. Is there a way that you can share some of those responsibilities that would give you a little bit of break from caregiving um, and, but that you can do in a safe way? 
and what we think in general with any of the strategies we're talking about, if you can make small changes, we think that they can really be meaningful um, for your health and well-being in the long run. So just even small changes um, uh, can make a big difference. And then we also think it's been really important um, for caregivers um, to acknowledge that um, during this time, it may be necessary to relax your standards. And this could mean um, allowing your loved one to watch TV more often. And um, none of us likes the idea of sitting on the couch and watching TV for hours on end. Um, but during this really unusual time, maybe that's just okay um, to let that happen. Um, also accepting that your loved one may not shower and get dressed per their usual schedule. But um, we've had caregivers say that they've had to kind of relax and just know that their loved one is just gonna stay in their sweatpants or their pajamas for the day and that they've just got to be okay with that. Um, and again, these are just all ways to think about getting a little bit of break from the stress of caregiving. Um, a few examples um, in, in regards to the small changes to caregiving. This is one of our caregivers um, said that she uses a, a product called the Amazon Fire Stick and it allows her remotely from a different part of the house to replay her husband's favorite nature television program. And he loves the show. It occupies his time. He doesn't remember that he's already seen it. And she can be in a different room reading or exercising. And she can kind of restart the program um, very seamlessly. So that's been a, a small form of respite for her. Another caregiver um, who's lost a lot of the caregiving help um, uh, from the pandemic and is assuming more um, care issues on his own and said that it's been hard to manage his wife's incontinence um, by myself um, when she can no longer go to a day program. And so what he did is he added a small pad, she's incontinent, so he added a small pad inside of her adult diaper and found that he can kind of remove the damp pad without having to change the whole adult diaper um, frequently throughout the day and that, that has saved him some time and stress um, in, in dealing with the personal care issues. So again, small changes, but I think they make a big deal in the long run and, and are helpful in the long run. And I'm gonna turn this now over to Dr. Rojas. Yeah, so in general, the prescriptions that, that we use for well-being in, in normal circumstances uh, do not necessarily need to change or don't, don't necessarily need to, to uh, be different uh, compared to now. We need to adjust a little bit and this requires a little bit of creativity. When you are doing your task, uh, tasks of caregiving, when you're dealing with difficult behaviors in normal circumstances, we, we want you to be creative. We want you to do things that work for you that maybe not work, may, may not work for other people, uh, but may be appropriate to your circumstances. So this is exactly the same thing with the prescriptions for well-being. There's a lot of evidence supporting that well-being revolves around fitness, aerobic uh, conditioning, good sleep, a healthy diet, staying connected socially, staying cognitively engaged. And this is exactly the same that we, we, uh, we want you to achieve. These are standards, of course, uh, as Jennifer mentioned, we don't necessarily want you to, to be 100% there by next week. We understand that this is a slow process and you, know, you take what you can do and even a small step is gonna be very meaningful. But we need to uh, make some adaptations. So the creativity here uh, on, on exercise, for example, um, you can start thinking about small goals like exercising at least 10 minutes per day, uh, you know, try to stay fit, exercise with other people, just be creative. Let's see the next slide. For example, before the COVID-19, uh, the Washington Post published this um, series of exercises, uh, 12 exercises recommended by experts in motion, obesity prevention, and physical fitness that you could do not in a gym, but you know, in your office and or at home. And um, they can be a, a resource if you um, have little time to go out or you cannot go out at all. Next slide. Um, there are a lot of resources online these days um, that um, uh, are normally available. Some um, vendors are now providing free um, lessons. Uh, some platforms offer cardio boot camp, uh, core exercises, yoga, stretching, Feldenkrais. Uh, the classes vary in, in length and duration. Some classes are live, but most are pre-recorded. And um, they have individual classes that are 
uh, boot camp or training program uh, based. Uh, some classes require a little of equipment like weights, a mat or a towel, but others don't. And um, you can use your smartphone, your tablet, computers, or possibly even stream to your TV. Um, you don't necessarily need a bike, for example, for things like Peloton, but Peloton is uh, uh, offering uh, a free 90 day uh, service. Um, and then uh, this, in this example, uh, some students are um, going out and um, helping, offering services to help people exercise at home. So you can pair with, uh, with some of these services and, and, and be encouraged to do it. Um, uh, we have a lot of links here. I, um, and of course, this, this presentation will be recorded, but you can go back uh, with time and, and revise the, all these resources. Uh, and then we'll also have a do separate document with, uh, with all these resources, a uh, compilation. Next slide. Um, yeah, this idea of, you know, do I need to go on my regular run at the park or um, um, at the gym in a treadmill if I don't have a treadmill at home? You know, you can be creative and, and just, you have a flare of stairs that is close to you. You can just go up and down several times or do the example of this professional marathon runner who uh, ran a full marathon on a top roof of uh, his building in New York City. So uh, even in a confined space, you can, you can find an opportunity to do aerobic exercise. Next slide. If you are adventurous enough and you, and you want to go out, and you have the, the elements in place, uh, you feel uh, confident enough that you, there's enough control and you want to go out, um, Remember, be mindful that uh, the face covering might be important. There's research coming out from uh, the Netherlands and Belgium uh, societies where biking is, is, uh, is very prevalent. And this, this research shows that the recommendation for distance, uh, the six feet recommendation that uh, we are, uh, um, we're using by the CDC applies for stationary people, people who are maybe walking or standing. But when uh, people are running or biking, the turbulence um, and the, the aerosol and the sprays that are generated may have an outer reach or a farther reach. Uh, so with a potential of uh, actually um, uh, in, uh, causing infection uh, if, if someone is sick. So it's very important to be mindful of the distances. Maybe if people are running, the distance is, is double, you know, 12 feet. And if people are biking, maybe 20, 20 feet between, between people is important. And as much as possible, use uh, co co uh, co covers of face. Next slide. You know, I use this a lot even before the COVID-19. Some people cannot get out of the house uh, for many reasons, you know, lack of resources, or it's difficult to make the, uh, the patient come out of the house, or there's really no time and, and uh, uh, this, is, this becomes a problem. You know, I, I tell people just, just turn on the radio, uh, put some music and, and dance. And even 20, 20 minutes of dancing, some aerobic activity uh, will be beneficial, not only from the uh, cardiovascular point of view, but there's, there's a lot of uh, research showing that um, music uh, brings a lot of cognitive benefits and, and it creates some connection. Uh, so uh, the, the psychological effect uh, of dancing, especially dancing with partners, is, is, is huge. And, and, and these are resorts that is easily enacted in, in our circumstances. Next slide. Um, the next point of well-being is, is um, um, diet. And the best evidence for well-being is around the Mediterranean diet. So we, we try to stay um, on track. Um, it's very easy in our in our times in these difficult circumstances to just you know eat eat, uh, eat junk food, stay in the couch, and and not do much. But even a small change, even if you uh, enact uh, a small change, it probably will be very very meaningful. So we are recommending that um, people uh, keep up as much as possible with the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterra Mediterranean diet has the benefit of a lot of the ingredients um, are, you probably already have them in, in, in cans uh, in, your, in your pantry. Uh, so uh, as a reminder, it focuses on plant-based nutrition, less emphasis on meat and dairy. And um, so it tried, we it generally, we tried to eat um, uh, five or six servings of um, uh, vegetables. So eat rainbow, things of uh, vegetables that are colorful. Uh, your fist, is about the size of a portion. So uh, 
five or six portions of that a day, that will be the ideal. Again, if you cannot do it, you cannot get to that, you know, at least one portion or two portions, any change will be meaningful. Swap white grains for whole grains if possible, legumes, at least one serving a day, cook with olive oil instead of butter, uh, have meat just once a day or less, and drink water daily. And then th this concept of uh, culinary medicine. So the food preparation, as it says there, nourishes the soul in a similar way that food nourishes the body, especially now in, in the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic, uh, intentional food preparation and eating can help us slow down this stress and appreciate the simple sensations of preparing and enjoying nutritious food. You know, when you're cooking, the most important ingredient is love. And when you're cooking for your loved ones, it becomes really meaningful. So try, try. The, this is where the, the creativity comes about. I tried something creative, cook together online, you know, cook the same recipe with your friends, um, cook everyone or get everyone involved in the cooking at home, you know, even, even the kids, if, if, if there are children around or the, the person with the dementia can also participate in the, in the preparation process. Cook in bulk, you know, try to cook uh, for more days. Usually we just cook what we eat, but try, uh, uh, try to cook for um, um, in preparation and look for recipes that call for less ingredients. Um, ask friends for recipes to avoid getting bored. Um, extend your budget. Make your own vegetable stock, for example, um, with, with remnants of, of the, the veggies that you peel. So this link is, is very good that you have there is a, um, an expert in culinary medicine in Youth Southwestern. And um, I, I rec highly recommend it. It's, it's, it's a phenomenal resource. Uh, so um, also remember when you're, when you're uh, uh, trying to come up with new ways of pre preparing food, um, not everything, not, not all the recipes will come out perfectly or even ed edible at the first time, but keep practicing and keep having fun with it. Next slide. It is again very easy in these times of um, um, of change to ch uh, to have a disruption in in our daily routine, and an affection or a change in the sleep pattern can could have major consequences. So we need to pay a lot of attention to our, our sleep routine. The recommendations are the same. So try to have a regular bedtime and waking time. And if you feel tired, it's okay to take a nap. Shorter naps are better. And try uh, to incorporate them on, on, a, on, a, on a, uh, the same, uh, the same time of the day every day. Cut back on alcohol and caffeine if this is becoming becoming a problem. Uh, cut back on uh, uh, sh sugary foods before before going to bed. Try to exercise earlier in the day. Although for some people it works to work out just before going to bed, uh, they feel more more uh, tired and they can fall uh, fall asleep more easily. But in general, we recommend the excitation of the exercise, especially if it's aerobic, to come early in the morning. But you know, you have to play with it. You have to, to know what works for you. Make sure that the space that you're, um, you're sleeping uh, in is comfortable, that uh, the bed is not a problem, that the illumination is correct, that the temperature is correct. Around 68 degrees of temperature is, is, is the, uh, uh, the best temperature based on, on research. Uh, try to block all the distracting noise, uh, eliminate light as much as possible. Um, this, this aspect it might not be easy to control. You know, you might have to talk to your neighbors if, if your neighbor is bothering you. You know, you have to bring, humanize it and say, you know, we're having this issue. It, it, you have to probably reach out to your normal level of operation to try to, to minimize all these, these problems with um, uh, distractors during sleep. And you know, uh, when you're confined, it's very easy to um, uh, use the bed for other things, uh, uh, for things other than than sex and 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 and, and sleep. So um, even though we are tempted to have a picnic on the bed when we're confined, and we we need to condition ourselves to have bed only uh, only for uh, sleep and sex and avoid other other. Uh, activities, including recreational activities like watching TV or reading. So if possible, these are recommendations to uh, have a good uh, sleep hygiene. Okay, uh, let's do the next slide. 
So this is a very important aspect too. Uh, as Jennifer mentioned, the, these difficult circumstances that hit humanity once in a generation, um, very unique and can, be, can have devastating effects on, on mental health. So it is very important to have awareness. Um, this, is not, this is important not only for you, but uh, a sound mind is important for caregiving purposes. So if, if, if you care about your loved one, your, your ability to care for that loved one will uh, be um, contingent upon how, how well you feel. And, and it's very easy to overlook the mental aspect, the, the mental well-being. So there are, these are a few recommendations to keep, keep uh, track of uh, how you're doing, in addition to the resources that Jennifer mentioned, which are, are more to, um, um, to identify how you're feeling, but this is, these are things that I, you can actually do. Meditation, mindfulness, um, um, stress reduction, mindfulness-based stress reduction are, are, are very effective. Um, it is, it is hard to devote, you know, 15, 30 minutes just to meditation, especially in our circumstances. So you can try uh, techniques uh, that call for micro meditation. For example, uh, some, some techniques help you to meditate um, within seconds, right? To have uh, a couple of cycles of respiration for 10 seconds and, and disconnect completely. And even that seems to make a difference. People have been doing that. Yeah, I'm, I'm putting this reference here by Elizabeth Blackburn. People were doing it before, you know, when people will get to work and, and, and it's a very busy environment and you log into your computer and, and whatever, all that time that, that it takes for your computer to log in and be ready, take that space to, to meditate. So you can do that at home, space, find a space, find a, a right time to, to, do, to, to do this um, this uh, meditation, there's a lot of training uh, um, resources out there. There's a lot of apps. Um, consider uh, online courses. They are very uh, widely available now. I, I see every day new organizations are coming up with their, with their courses. A lot of them are, are free. Um, and a lot of these courses not only teach medica meditation practices, but also um, movement exercises to shift awareness body awareness methods to stay tuned into what your body needs uh, and, and mindful movement guidance to develop a daily practice. And a lot of these um, programs incorporate yoga, tai chi, or Feldenkrais. Um, or, you know, try reading something, something uplifting, not necessarily well-being for something that you, you like. Uh, next slide. So a lot of leaders of thought, philosophers, and now neuroscientists, have uh, identified kindness as a big element uh, to promote well-being. Uh, happiness has, has a direct correlate with the practice of compassion. So traits like compassion and optimism show consistent behavioral and health benefits that contribute to well-being. Neuroscientists, for example, have identified neural networks that mediate empathic concern and behaviors associated um, with altruism can be modulated through education and training. Um, and this is all associated with positive emotions, uh, a sense of affiliation, reward, and prosocial behaviors. So in, in times of disaster, it, love is what makes your body heal faster. So we have a lot of opportunities during these difficult times to show kindness to others. And not only this will be, do a social good, but it will be, do a, it will, it will be doing a, such, a good to you biologically. Acts of kindness are, are associated with the release of neurotransmitters associated with well-being, oxytocin, serotonin, dopamine. So we need to exercise this muscle to the muscle of compassion. And, and these circumstances are, are, um, are ideal to try to do that. Again, you don't need to be the most compassionate person, but try one exercise, one, one act every day. And a, a, an example that I can think of now is, you know, if someone cuts you on the line of, for the supermarket, you know, that's the moment for you to not get angry and maybe show the compassion. Try to put yourself in the shoes of that person. Maybe, maybe that person is suffering at a different level uh, compared to you. And this is your moment to, to be kind, to be respectful, to be empathetic, 
and, and to be try to do good. Okay, next one. This is something that um, um, Jennifer touch, uh, talked about a little bit, identifying uh, the sources of stress. In my view, when you are care caring for someone, the main source of stress would be, you know, the worry of having your loved ones stay safe, you know, stay healthy. Uh, you want to, you know, maybe you're worried about whether they have symptoms, whether they're going to be infected, whether, you know, all this, all this, uh, um, ancillary problems that come when you're you're facing a pandemic and you're in a lockdown. So it's good to have a list, make a list of the things that you believe um, are, are a source of stress, write them down, and then try to classify them. What are things that I, I can act upon and those things that I, I cannot act upon? And those, the things that you can um, influence, well, try to develop a little, a little plan so you don't, you're not get you're not caught off guard. And that, that brings a little bit, the, the sense of control helps you relieve the stress. Um, so the risk is higher, the risk of mental disorders or acute mental problems, acute mental, acute um, uh, emergencies is higher in people who ha already have a history of mood disorders. So be, be mindful of this. So next slide, if you have, um, a difficulty. Remember, doctors are, are here for you, and a lot of organizations are making themselves available now um, online. Reach to your doctors if, if, if you feel um, you feel you you having problems with this. It doesn't have to be a, a medication solution, but you can start with counseling. And of course, you know, reach out to to a friend, to your family, uh, reach out to to your close network. Um, and this is already helpful, you know, that the, the, we, we have seen evidence in the literature that the traits of a caregiver matter in, in how the patient, do, like the, the patient with dementia does. So if you tend to have a more optimistic attitude, a more extroverted attitude, you'll be more likely to be connected and to have feedback on how you're doing. And that is translated into the caregiving you're, you're providing as opposed to being introverted and, and, and be more neurotic and, you know, being um, uh, constrained within, within yourself, that, that creates uh, a negative feedback loop that, that also is projected to the patient. And, and the research shows that over time, uh, a, negative, a negative situation makes the, per, the, per, the patient uh, be worse. So um, use the resources, it's, 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 it's critical. And then the last point in the next slide, if you feel there's an emergency, don't forget that there are resources out there. And you know, the typical online resources uh, are available, the, the, the phone lines for suicide prevention. And now we have um, a lot of volunteers, you know, the, the San Francisco Suicide Prevention is reporting an increase in the, um, in, in the reach out that they, they're seeing uh, because of people have experiencing uh, negative feelings. And uh, so a, a, a group of volunteers is, is now uh, providing, helping out with, with, this, with this crisis. And uh, now they're offering uh, services through text. So if you're, if you're more comfortable just texting someone, you know, there might be someone, someone there who could help you through text as well. Um, and then uh, the last part is um, don't forget to stay cognitively engaged, socially connected. Uh, so, um, you know, this means uh, we can see that the, the, the last slide, for example, it's a, it's a nice it's a nice example of what we can do. You know, stay connected, st talk to your friends, don't don't keep it to yourself, but reach out to your family, share, celebrate, play, uh, be creative. This is a, again a, another time to be creative. Um, you can you can um, play games, you can enjoy art together, enjoy a movie together, as we said, cook together, exercise together. Um, you can do altruistic things together, you know, like this example of, of Matthew McConaughey. You don't need to do it with Matthew McConaughey, but you can reach out to people in need and help them uh, with the, the tools that we have, uh, have a better day today. And uh, this will, you know, keep you, keep you um, part of the community. And then remember, you know, the most important thing that you are doing, um, even if you don't, don't do any of these things, uh, just sheltering in place and following the rules, it's, it's a major contribution to you, 
to the, 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 the people you're caring for and, and to, to everyone in, the, in society. These are difficult times. This uh, touches only, you know, once, touches us once in a lifetime. This is our, our, our time to, to show what we're made of. And, and I think uh, we, we should be able to make, keep the, the world a good place. So I would like to uh, give time now to, to hear some of your questions. And we are very interested in hearing what strategies you're doing to stay fit and to stay healthy. And, and mostly, not, not, not for us, but we, we, want, we want you to share them with everyone else. So this is a, a good avenue to share, or a good venue, I'm sorry, to share those ideas with others. Thank you. And it looks like we have a couple of comments um, from Cynthia. It says, my mom is able to be more active and chooses to sit and do puzzles most of the day. How much physical activity or other activities should she be engaging in? You know, minimal, there are standards, okay? So the, the Department of Public Health um, has a standard for physical activity for Americans that based on the research, only about 20% of Americans follow. For people above, uh, above 60, 65 years of age, um, the recommendation is at least 150 minutes of aerobic exercise per week spread most time, most days of the week. Although if you can just concentrate it in one day, it's okay, but it's not as good as if you spread it out. So 150 minutes of aerobic exercise has to be moderate to intense, meaning this is something that increases the, the heart rate, uh, makes you sweat a little bit, makes you a little bit winded, makes you tired. And that's, that intense exercise is what, what has the best benefits. And then for adults, it's also recommended that for people above 65, this aerobic uh, training should be paired with uh, stretching and weightlifting. Now, that's the standard, right? We, we want you to, to be there, but even, even if you do a fraction of that, even if you do a 10% of that, the, the modeling and the research shows that there should be a benefit. So if your mother is, is doing the, the crossword puzzles and there's no way she could exercise, well, you can start with a walk. Just take a, a ten minute walk, and that should make a difference and you know we don't we, 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 we give you the standards we give you the goal, but we, no one expects that that you or your loved one will be an athlete by next week right you, so you can gradually gradually incorporate this and remember this is this is what the leaders are telling us this is not a, a sprint right we, this is a marathon, so this will take months, so we should come up with a little plan to little by little start going back to, 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 to normal and introduce these healthy, healthy lifestyle uh, interventions. That's great. And I, I would also add for that caregiver that um, it's great that she's really worried about thinking about her mom's physical activity and, and um, maybe there's a way to ensure that her mom gets up and moves around a little bit, like Dr. Rojas said, maybe a 10 minute walk. Uh, but it's also an opportunity for the caregiver to get some activity. So is there something that, that you and your mom can do together that would give you some activity and a break from sitting and doing the puzzle? So um, to think about um, even just small changes that you might be able to do to incorporate, you know, your own physical health. Um, we had um, a caregiver um, that we just heard of um, today that um, decided to move her treadmill um, out of the garage and put it um, in the living room next to the TV. And her thinking was, well, um, if I'm going to sit down and watch TV for 15 minutes, uh, I can be walking during that time rather than sitting and watching TV. So made a small change, um, kind of moved the furniture around, um, but recognized that it would probably be better for her um, to just make that, that small change and do a little bit more walking during the day. And um, then she's also able to sort of uh, pay attention to her caregiving responsibilities too. Um, and we've had a few other caregivers talk about taking up journaling or resuming journaling um, because they found like they had a little bit more time to do it. And I think that's also kind of gets into what Dr. Rojas talked about with the mindfulness and, and really sort of um, uh, 
being more mindful, sort of trying to get rid of some of the negative thoughts, even for a moment, journal, maybe some positive memories, or just journal about, you know, the things that are stressing you out. And sometimes that can help you kind of face what you're worried about, um, and then help you sort of see a way to, um, to for, for action plans to sort of address the stress. Um, and uh, I was also thinking too, we've heard from a few caregivers that there's, if you go on YouTube, there's a lot of 30 day challenges now for things. There's 30 day challenges to starting yoga um, and meditation. And so um, there may be, and maybe some of the caregivers um, that are listening today, maybe they've had some experience, but there, there are like, like uh, Dr. Rojas said, where it, this is going to be a marathon. Um, so we're going to be in this for a while. So um, a 30 day challenge for some sort of physical or emotional well-being act might be a great thing um, to start and just even a tiny incorporation, you know, for a tiny bit of the day may make a, a tremendous benefit um, for health and well-being. Great. Yeah, and I would like to, I would like to add something about that point too. Um, the, the aspect of, um, you know, someone, someone with dementia spending time in a sedentary activity like the, the crossword puzzle, watching TV or and, and we need to explore. I mean, this is where I say it, it, the creativity is very important because it, 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 one remedy doesn't, doesn't work for everyone. So in the case of, of your mother, for example, if she's doing a crossword puzzle and you're inviting, inviting her to for a walk or exercise or do some stretching or exercise, you know, some activity and she refuses, we have to understand why she's refusing. We, it's very common, for example, that when there are... Um, there's aversion to mobility. There are issues with pain, and we maybe need to address the pain problems first before, or or you know, fear with imbalance or risk of. So all these more element elemental aspects of being active need to be explored. You know, is there any any anything that will prevent some patients with dementia may not be able to vocalize or to articulate exactly what the problem is. So we need to be very aware and try to to see if there's any anything that is preventing her from exercising. And I'll also add to that, that sometimes what comes up a lot, um, families say that, you know, they'll suggest to their loved one who has dementia, um, do you want to go for a walk now? Or should we go do this? And the answer often is no, um, because we do see a certain amount of apathy or passivity or less drive in, in, in these illnesses. And so um, if that's the case too, uh, what we what we often suggest is try phrasing that question in a different way. So it's not so open-ended you're not giving the person such a big opportunity to say no, but it can be more like, do you want to wear your red sweater or your brown sweater while we go for our walk or come with me or let's do this together, um, which uh, sometimes being a little bit more directive in how you ask can, can help as well too. So I'll just add that because that does come up quite a bit. Thank you. We have some more comments. So from Rabina, she says, I think she used to go to art walks and wine festivals to sell children's products, but nine of her shows have been canceled. So now she's making a lot of face masks and donating um, them and even selling some to make money. And when her husband is in bed early, I'm guessing in the evening he might go to bed before she does, she, get, she goes and sews. And she says this helps her a lot to avoid getting depressed because it's really hard right now. She also adds that during the day, she and her husband, they go for a walk and they do puzzles, they throw a ball, they paint, play dominoes and, and also do dancing. So she's getting a lot of variety in there. That's wonderful. That's great. That's fantastic. I think that, 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 that word is good, the variety. That, that probably is making also an impact. Um, yeah, thank you for sharing that. That's beautiful. And I think also the altruistic piece that, that she is, this caregiver is doing something to benefit others with the sewing um, and has found the right time of day to do it. So it doesn't conflict with her caregiving. She's taking advantage of the time that her husband is in bed is also like um, a really um, great sort of strategy that she's worked out. Um, and I think I would think doing the sewing and donating um, helps, um, helps with sort of that feeling of the greater good that you're sort of contributing um, to the greater good and you're making a contribution during this very stressful time using the talents that you have. And so, yeah, that's, that's a wonderful example. It's wonderful. And Ben says it's been helpful for him to do things that create beauty. So planting flowers, refinishing a piece of furniture, and even cleaning out and organizing a closet or cupboard. Great examples and probably comes with a feeling of very, um, of, personal well-being and success, which are all 
really positive emotions to be uh, feeling. And I think those positive emotions of getting those things done and being sort of proud of the work and sort of noticing the beauty of the work that you're doing um, helps replace some of those negative emotions that we are all, I think, feeling, which is anxiety and stress and worry. Um, so even a momentary break from those negative emotions with those positive feelings is, is great. Those, again, great examples. And Christina says they've tried music and dance. And I'm curious if people find, you know, there's music and memory where people use the headphones and listen to music. And um, I wonder if other people have found different strategies. Like, is it is it a certain type of music that people really respond to or um, if there are any kind of particular tricks around? Yeah, the, the practice on, or the, the, the practical examples on, on the success of music, um, very anecdotal, I, I would say, but it has to do with the person. It, it's not that this type of classical music is going to be soothing for everyone. No, it's more about who that person is. Let's let's see what sort of person evokes good feelings. Maybe are songs that or or, or uh, music that the person grew up listening to. And we've seen numerous cases of the the music. The music that is more soothing is music that held with the rem reminiscence right putting putting a, a little uh, uh, lifeline to the past something that is very ingrained and so the, in Alzheimer's disease for example the the, the, the recent memories are affected right the, the, the heat of the moment in the radio is not going to be as appealing of, as the song that was you know uh, 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 the person can actually remember um, from the past. So it's, you have to do trial and error. And um, just a question. I invite other questions before we wrap up, but some, something that came up for me while you guys were talking and is that I hear there's a lot people, I think Jennifer mentioned this, feel a, a real sense of responsibility for the person's health and there there's heightened risk. And you know, how, how to cope with this sense of responsibility where you want to try to keep someone active and yet taking them outside when they don't follow social distancing might increase their risk for these health problems and, um, and also that trying to, you know, make more time for yourself might mean you're giving less attention to someone and that could affect their behavior and, and their, their well-being. So how do you, how do you kind of deal with this pressure and responsibility. Yeah, I think those are, are real stresses. Um, we've had a lot of caregivers worry that um, is, are the changes that they're seeing in their loved one a sign that their, their condition is advancing or is it a sign of something new like a medical infection? Um, and certainly everybody's on edge right now worried about exposure and the risk for illness. And I think um, first off, um, try not to feel that you're alone. You're not alone. You don't have to try to make these decisions um, and come to these conclusions by yourself. Reach out to the primary care provider with your concerns. Use your support group. Use some of the, the resources that we've listed in the slide, um, in the slideshow um, to reach out and connect with people and get other advice and other guidance from people so that you don't feel like you're alone. The, we do have a number of patients that aren't um, being as cognizant or aware of the need for social distancing. It, um, we've had a lot of caregivers say that's been a real challenge for them. And on our website, we've put um, together a few suggestions of maybe changing the time of day that you go out, where maybe you're going out in a less crowded time, um, wearing face masks, which are now um, um, required. But a face mask is also a clue to your loved one that there is something going on. And so if your loved one wears a face mask and you wear a face mask and you go out and everybody else is wearing a face mask, that might help sort of reinforce the idea that, that we are um, sort of behaving and needing to behave in a, in a different way right now. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know, Dr. Rose, if you have anything Yeah, no, else. I will say what you said before, you, uh, Jennifer, which is um, you, might, you might need to relax your rules in this new scenario. It is, it is expected that when there is a change in routine and change of pattern of things that happen during the day, symptoms may fluctuate. Someone with dementia may seem that is doing worse, but it's, it's part of this new day-to-day. Um, new -day. um, 
So you might you might need to relax the rules. Maybe you were you you were on a schedule for meals or the bathroom, for example. With this new situation, you might need to relax or readjust, and you might you might take a little bit of trial and error. And again, what may work for you is not necessarily gonna going to work for someone else. So it has to be very personalized. Um, but I agree, it's 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 something that you should do, you know, with in, in, uh, with, with your providers and, and with, with your support network. This is a time to be in a network, to be, <laughs> you know, to reach out and to people who love you, people who care about you, stay connected and help each other. And that's, that's the best way to, to, to move forward. Yeah, if you've, ever re- if you've never reached out, this is a good time to try to reach out to people. And you might have to reach out in a way that's different. Um, it won't be necessarily in person, but it may be over the phone, but I think it is. Um, important. And, and another thing that sort of occurred to me thinking about this is that we know that for most people with cognitive impairment, a structure and a predictability to the day is a source of comfort. And um, so I think what, what the idea that I had sort of thinking about this is that so you want to sort of keep some sort of predictability and structure to your day for you and your loved one. And maybe that part of that structure is making sure that you do take care of your own health and well-being, that you are kind to yourself and that it is okay for you to take some time out to either exercise or meditate or read a book or take a nap um, and that that's okay. And it's actually critically important that you do and to build that into into your day. Um, we just think will be pretty important. Thank you. And the other concern that I've heard is some caregivers are are managing more of the tasks of caregiving than they otherwise would because they want to limit the exposure. So they're not having as many home care aides come into the house. And, um, you know, we've been in this shelter in place for over a month now. So it, this is, you know, there's still uncertainty about if it's safe. Like, is it is it time to have someone hire someone to come in the house or is it better to wait? Um, there's a lot of uncertainty around how long this is going to last and curious what your thoughts are around that. Well, caregiver continues to happen. There's been a decrease, but a lot of people are still paired with their paid caregivers and caregivers are coming to homes and delivering the service. It just has, uh, it comes down to how much control do you think you can have? If, 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 if the tasks are really over you and, and you are feeling overwhelmed, it's, it's not a bad idea to consider um, recruiting your, your caregivers. Maybe on a different schedule, maybe with a lot of emphasis on uh, a, a prevention of infection and, and the protective equipment and, and uh, the habits to prevent infection. Maybe, maybe you need to uh, incorporate a little bit of that, but it's happening. And again, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a prescription that can be done to everyone, it has to be tailored to your needs. And I think maybe having, um, I think each case is gonna be individual um, in terms of your comfort level and sort of what kind of care you might need. And if, you know, if there is a, if you are considering hiring a caregiver to come into your home or keeping the caregiver that you have, um, but some things you might think about is maybe, um, maybe if you were going to have a caregiver, you have one caregiver, you know, and not multiple caregivers and have a frank discussion with those that one caregiver, those caregivers about um, sort of what their situation is and what their exposure risk may be. Um, because if, I think, again, it's about identifying what is your anxiety, what is the source of stress for you. And if, and if the risk for exposure is really a source of stress, I think the more information you can get, then you can make kind of an informed decision that you feel comfortable with. And I don't, I think most of this, um, none of these decisions are like ideal. Um, and none of these decisions we feel 100% comfortable with, but it's a matter of kind of finding um, where are you the most comfortable um, in, in either bringing help um, into your home or changing the aspects, changing the ways that you do the caregiving. And, and again, sometimes that may be relaxing some standards, um, which I think is hard for most people to do, but it may be, may be necessary. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions coming in, and I, I feel like we've addressed a lot of the, the topics that were covered. So thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available on our website at memory.ucsf.edu slash COVID. And I also want to invite you to join us next week. Um, 
with uh, Dr. Ashwin Cotwell, who will be talking about preparing for a potential COVID infection and dementia and talking about what the odds are, what the experience has been in the Bay Area and what the options are for treatment and management. So looking forward to that topic next week. And thank you all again for joining us and thank you to our presenters, Jennifer and Julio, great job. Thank you very much.